welcome to our warm welcome space. It's great to have you all in this training. So as I said, this is the very first session of community organizing training that we are developing as part of the Warm Welcome campaign. This training is put together by organizers from the Center for Theology and Community and from Citizens UK. Uh, so let me start by sharing some of the logistics for today. Uh, Anna, can we please uh, have the first slide? Thank you very much. So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is uh, the first uh, of our training sessions and today we're going to talk about the relationships and the importance of relationships in warm spaces and in community organizing. Um, special welcome to Ria from Good Faith Partnership. We are here to give us a wave. Say hello to everyone. So Ria is helping us with tech and we hope that tech will work for us today and we're going to have a great session. So please keep on mute as we are speaking and as we are delivering the training. Uh, there is going to be an opportunity for you to share your thoughts, your insights, your reactions. Uh, so please make sure you use the chat. I really encourage you to start using the chat now. Please introduce yourself. Tell us your name. Tell us where you are calling from and the name of your warm space. Um, so please use the chat, but also we are going to have two breakout rooms. Uh, so this is your opportunity to meet people from other parts of the country and other people from the Warm Welcome Network. Uh, just to let you know, the uh, meeting is going uh, to be recorded um, because there are people who wanted to join the training, but the timing may not be great. But also we want to share the opportunity with other people who want to learn about community organizing. If possible, please keep your cameras on, especially as we are in the breakout rooms. I know that it may be difficult for some of you, uh, but we would really appreciate. Uh, it works for us as trainers. We want to see the faces of people that we are speaking to, but I think it helps people in the room as well. So if that's possible, please keep your camera on. Uh, my name is Marzana Cihon Balcerovic, and I'm the lead organizer for the One Welcome campaign. I work for the Center for Theology in Community, and I'm based in East London. And I'm here with my uh, very talented and very brilliant organizing team. So I would like to introduce you to George from Citizens UK. George, if you give us a wave, brilliant. Uh, Joe and Anna from the Center for Theology and Community. So they are going to deliver the training together with me. So community organizing uh, is about bringing people together. So as community organizers, we work with people from diverse backgrounds and we bring them together to empower them to take action and to develop the agency for change. Uh, Anna, can I please have next slide? So with community organizing, it all starts with relationships, which is why the first session that we are putting together is about warm space as a place of connection. Um, okay. After we build relationships of trust with the people that are part of the organizations and neighborhoods where we work, we listen. So we bring people together to listen, to identify the issues that they may have in common, issues that they care about, and then we strategize together and develop um, a strategy for developing action. So this is the journey that we want to take you on. Um, we are going to run three training sessions uh, every month. Each of the training sessions is going to be followed by a drop-in session a week after, where we are going to take some of the learning from the session and, and work with you to think how you can implement the training into your one space. Um, so we are going to share some of the basic concepts and tools of community organizing, something that we hope will help you empower your warm spaces. I hope we, it will help you strengthen your teams and it will also help you to better identify the needs of the people that you might be working with and serving. Uh, we know that there are many great people on this call. We know that a lot of you are already doing amazing work and we really want to recognize you for that and say a big thank you for all the work that you do in the warm spaces across the country. So we come from different parts of the country. Uh, we come from different organizations. Um, some of us come from institutions of faith. Some of us are no faith. We may be young, um, maybe not so young, um, but all we are all here together because we are part of the Warm Welcome Network and the Warm Welcome Campaign. So what brings us together is the commitment to this work. And we are committed to this work because of the values that we share. Actions, actions motivate us to act and, 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 and values 
uh, motivate us to act, sorry. And the, this is what uh, makes us to work in the warm spaces where we are all based and connected. So I would like to start this session by actually giving you an opportunity to speak and share together what are the values that bring you into the warm space. So what motivates you to work uh, for the warm uh, welcome, to uh, be involved in the warm spaces, whether you are a host or whether you are a volunteer or whether you are a visitor, we would like to hear from you. So we are going to invite you to the breakout rooms. Uh, each of you will have an opportunity to be in a breakout room with two other people. So we have rooms of three people and you are going to have three minutes to share what motivates you to be involved in the One Welcome campaign, uh, but also um, what are the values that you want to instill in your workspace? So over to you. Ria, are we ready with the breakout rooms? Fantastic, thank you. Um, if you could put some of the values that came up in your conversation, if you could put it in the chat, that would be wonderful. Um, so I just, just briefly, I'm originally from Poland, as you may say by my accent, uh, and something that um, I feel very lucky about is the fact that I work for the organization that and do the work that I'm really passionate about. So I've been involved in community organizing, community building nearly for 20 years, uh, and something that I really care about. So um, I come from a place that has a very close knit community where everybody was connected together and I had my family and my friends next to me. But then when I came to London, um, it was a bit different experience. And although I was very excited to come and study here, uh, there were moments when I was missing the support network that I had back home. And there were moments when I felt lonely or lost. So I really understand the value of uh, places that bring people together. And I think that it's very important that um, this is the work that we also also do. So uh, if you could share, um, what, what are the values that came up in your conversations? Anyone would like to uh, share briefly why you're involved in the Warm Welcome um, campaign and in running warm spaces? Uh, I think in our case, we started off uh tackling the uh you know the fuel costs uh, but realized that people love the company and so it's kind of gone on more to being about um supporting people in community brilliant thank you very much anyone else i, th I can see fran raising hand as well Fran from the old fire station yeah, it's an old fire station in, in Leeds. And and I think in our group, we were saying that uh, Jan and Kate were, we were all talking about that sense of community and communities supporting each other. And that, that, that warm space is a really key thing to those communities getting through difficult times. Definitely. Thank you very much. I can take one more. Anyone else would like to share? Uh, a, a Kundio, I'm yeah. sorry, I'm not sure. Yeah, okay, yes. Right. yes, yes, yes. We used to have a, a warm place in Saint Martin's years ago, and it's a place where some people are isolated, isolated, they're on their own. So when they are with us, they are able to meet people to speak to. So in, in that way, we were we were able to interact with people yeah yes absolutely i think yeah thank you very much um and i think this is something that resonates with all of us that we talk about the the value of connection the value of developing a sense of belonging together and the warmth that warm spaces offer but something that we want to bring this uh, in uh, into this warm space is also the value of fairness uh, so when you look at the Warm Welcome website and when you look at the mission for the organization, we talk about creating spaces for connection, but also creating spaces for fairness. And this is where we come in and we want to inspire and equip you with some tools that will help you to work, work on the issues for social justice and to exercise that fairness in your warm space. Uh, so without further ado, I now would like to invite you to watch a short video uh, from the BBC, 
Uh, so BBC recently visited one of the warm spaces that we work with, uh, St Barnabas Church in Wolfhamstow. And I'm going to invite George, who is going to tell you a story about that warm space. Over to you, Ria, with the video and then George. Fresh fruit and veg for the shelves. But this isn't a supermarket or corner shop. It's a church hall, converted into what's known as a warm space. This one in Walthamstow set up last year. The original plan to help people cope with the biggest rise in prices in 70 years. A year on, not much has changed. As far as cost of living is concerned, even people actually, like even two income families, it's such a tight squeeze at the moment. A lot of people that live on their own, they like to come. And there are other people that, that they can talk to as well. Vera's here today to stay warm, but also do a fresh food shop, all for a fraction of the price she'd pay down the road in a local supermarket. Everything's going up. You know, I have to minimise what I'm, how I spend my money. But far from being sites of desperation, these places have become beacons of hope for those that live nearby. People came because they were looking for warmth. Uh, that was the idea. They wouldn't be able to turn on the heating at home, so they came for the heating. But often what they did is they stayed for the meeting because they met people, they connected with people here and there in their communities. And we found that that social connection and meeting friends um, chatting with them, volunteering at spaces, that's been a really big impact. If you come here on a Thursday afternoon and you give out a hot chocolate to someone or you receive something or you have a chat with somebody, you talk to somebody, one of your neighbours, you'll see so much hope. Thank you so much for that video. Um, it makes me really proud to see it. Um, you might have seen around on the call that there are some of the people featured in it on this call. So, um, yeah, I'm very, very proud. My name is George. I'm, I'm an organiser with Citizens UK in Waltham Forest and St Barnabas, which features in the video, is one of the institutions that I work with. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about, a little bit about how we got to that point um, with the feature on BBC. Um, but before I do that, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. So I live in Waltham and I have done for the last two years or so. Um, and I was born in the UK, but I grew up in Australia and Switzerland. And that definitely had an impact on my sense of self in terms of you know, I belonged in a few different places, but they're nowhere really specific. My roots are kind of a bit confused and all over the place. Um, but I really feel a sense of belonging in Waltham Forest. Um, and that's, you know, changed my kind of sense of, okay, I feel really connected to this place. And warm spaces and places where people can meet in public are a really important part of that. The conversations that you meet, the people from different walks of life. So that really grounds me in my sense of doing community organizing work here in Waltham Forest. Um, but yeah, so how did we get to that point uh, of being filmed on the BBC? So there's definitely a bit of a backstory to explain to that. But I think the key takeaway for an organizing perspective is that it all started with building relationships in the community. And so St. Barnabas, it's located in Walthamstow and um, it's a di very diverse area and it has the extremes of both uh, wealth and poverty. Um, and they were, they're a very active church. Uh, and during the pandemic, they were involved in um, distributing COVID vaccinations. Um, but essentially, this period after the pandemic, kind of that confusing 2021 phase, people were feeling quite withdrawn. And there wasn't that much of a sense of, you know, what can we do? Um, yeah, there was a bit of confusion. And so um, at that point, they decided, OK, how can we reach out to the community? How can we get involved? And it started quite simply with um, something they called chocolate and chat. In, 20, in 2021 and it was simply on a Thursday afternoon they would provide um, hot chocolate for people who were coming out of school who were passing by and just as a way of you know getting to chat to people and talk to them about their lives about what's happening um, and that kind of you know kindled a sense of community spirit it uh, allowed people who are part of the congregation to to meet people that are passing by and building those relationships um, and so from that you know they started to listen to the idea things that people were saying, the stories, the, the struggles that people were having, which, you know, particularly emerged around things like affordable food, things like uh, bills being really expensive, um, and just general struggle. Um, from that, they'd kind of established this sense um, of community connection and, and then started to think, okay, we need to grow this. We need to have a place where we can then offer these things, you know, food, space, somewhere warm that people can go. Um, and so leaders who are part of that volunteering from the congregation at St. Barnabas started to look for funding um, to apply for a grant from the council, um, because next to St. Barnabas, adjacent to it, there's um, 
uh, there's a there's a sort of dilapidated building it was at the time. So they were like, okay, we need to get some funding for this, um, which they successfully managed to do in partnership with people that were in the community. So they live in somewhere called the Queen's Boundary Estate. Um, so there's a sign called the QBC, um, and that includes local residents themselves, the church, a local mosque. Um, and so those relationships, again, kind of strengthened and built through that, you know, chocolate and chat start. Um, and through that, they pulled um, together and they got the the money for the renovation of this space. Um, and then it, there was, you know, lots of kind of people getting involved, coming and painting, renovating the building um, through 2021. Um, and then they were ready to open it as a as a food pantry. And the idea of that is that people... Um, pay a little bit of a contribution and then they're able to have you know affordable shopping uh, and there's a local food distributor called the Hornbeam, which supplies them with food and, that. and I think there's also the Felix project and other kind of food um, which is coming in as well to help them um, but yes yeah, so there's you know all sorts of activities as well have kind of emerged from that so it's not only a food pantry there's lots of other activities that are going on but I think you know the key takeaway is that it started with quite a simple idea about building relationships in the community and it's about that kind of relational culture and then lots of amazing things have developed from that point and so i'm not going to you know tell you all of the things that are happening there but there are lots of things um so support for the refugee community for example support for a housing campaign we're going to save those lessons for the next training when we talk about how we go from uh listening to action um but yeah i'll leave it there and i'll pass it back to marjana thank you Thank you very much, George. This is a brilliant story and special hello to Laura, who is on the call and who was on the VPC call and who was also involved in setting up the warm space and did brilliant work of raising money and building relationships. Um, so as George said, there is more to this story. So if you hear more from George and you want to hear how we moved from relationship into listening and into action, I do encourage you to join our next training sessions. Uh, but for now, I would like to uh, introduce you to another video that we want to share. Um, and I need to be honest that it's more kind of homemade. It's not as slick as BBC video. It's something that we recently recorded when we were visited one of the warm spaces in Leytonstone. Uh, it's again a church in uh, called Holy Trinity Church. Uh, and we want to share it with you because we really wanted to give voice to the people who are involved in running this warm space to capture some of the reasons and uh, background to the relational uh, culture that they develop in their own space. So it's Holy Trinity Church in Leytonstone. Um, please watch it. So people who came to warm space, and that's the first interaction they ever had with church, they came to church over Christmas. And for me, that was really kingdom, because I just was able to see people who had never come into warm space, they're now like helping, or people who were coming um, through warm space to food share, they're now volunteering at food share, or they were here and now they're in church. Because it's a culture of equality, so you don't really have like a difference between people who are volunteering or serving and people who are guests and receiving. Because there's a knowledge that those people who are serving are also receiving. There's friendships that grow. And so, as I said, like the community have like a, I feel, an understanding of like looking after those who have looked after you. So, I mean, for us, I think we recognise God in everybody because that's our faith. It always starts with the leadership or the core team of volunteers. If you're relational in how you meet and how you um, do your team, that will then also flow out into how you are relational in the space. Thinking about how you get can get to know the volunteers better, um, how you can create a relational culture in meetings, and then thinking about that in the warm welcome space. Thank you very much. Uh, I will now hand over to Joe, uh, who is going to share a story about the work that he's recently been involved in, uh, setting up a warm space in one of the churches in Lasto. So over to you, Joe. Thanks, Marjana. Um, yeah, mate, I think that's probably the best of videos played since <laughs> with all the practices we've done, so that's great. Uh, often doesn't work that way when you actually do it. Um, actually in person but I just want to highlight two things that were said um, in that video so 
the uh, first is where Lovin says, um, because there is a culture of equality, we do not have a difference between volunteers who are serving and guests who are receiving, because there is a knowledge that those who are serving are also receiving. And that last bit is just really important to highlight um, in a relational culture that everyone's gaining something. It's not, you know, one person gets something and then leaves. Everyone in the relational culture is benefiting from it. Um, and also with Chanel at the end of the video where she says, uh, it starts with the leadership. If you're relational with how you do your team, that will flow out into your space. So again, for us who are maybe more involved in the leadership um, dynamic of our warm spaces, thinking about how we can be relational from the get-go and how that will then feed into actually naturally feeding uh, to, to the culture of our warm spaces. But we'll come back to the videos. First, I will introduce myself. So as Marjana said, my name is Joe. I'm a community organiser uh, at the Centre for Theology and Community, which is a charity that works with churches in East London to um, try and create positive social change by building relational power. Um, and before I talk about the difference between relational and transactional culture, I'm just going to give a little story about myself. So I grew up in a family uh, where conversations around politics and social injustice were, were the norm. And living that out was also the norm. So if you come to my house, um, you'll see walls that are filled with photos of me and my family at various different protests. Uh, the first one is me uh, in a buggy at three years old. And the, the latest one is probably me as, as a teenager. And, you know, it was much to my embarrassment growing up when friends would come out to my house and they would, they would see these photos. But so politics has always been very, very key to me and my family. And, and it still is. My dad is still very involved in, in politics. And my brothers are all uh, activists and involved in their unions. And, and my mum was involved in her teacher's union until, until she retired. So in many ways, I had what some people would consider quite a radical um upbringing um and something that was very it was deeply rooted at least in in, in politics and action uh, but since starting this work uh doing community organizing what i've found really radical is learning about the differences between a relational and transactional culture um and that's because while i've always believed in the prioritization of people and relationships uh, i've never actually seen it given a practical dimension or worked in spaces that really value it um and why I use the word transformative rather than radical is because I think by adopting a relational culture, we're in many ways asking you guys to begin a, a long journey of kind of gradually changing the way you relate to people and how you reflect that in your institution. So it's kind of a period of transforming, I think. Um, and that's really ultimately why I've shared my story at the start is because the background you come from uh, does not restrict you, I think, from adopting this relational perspective. Um, you know, my own background, which by all accounts cared very deeply about injustice and people, um, was still very restricted, I think, in actually understanding how to truly relate to people and individuals. So I think that shows actually that our relationships run deeper than politics, something much more intrinsic in our human nature. Um, we will come back to St. Martin's Church, which is where I'm working, but first, if we can go to the next slide. Um, uh, this is the kind of features, I think, of a transactional uh, culture and a relational culture. So in a transactional culture, which is kind of the dominant culture that we all experience, uh, people are treated as a means to an end. Often the program comes first, the people come second. It's very goal and target driven. It can be restrictive and it's very fast, it's very quick. You know, we're always trying to move on to the next thing. Whereas in a relational culture, people are often treated as ends in themselves. People are put before the program. It's about building connections and communicating with people on a personal level and can often be a very creative and liberating space because you're not as focused on meeting those goals and targets. You're focused on people. Um, and so, yeah, how this has worked at St. Martin's Church, which if we go back a slide, <laughs> is what you can see in the photo. Uh, at St. Martin's Church, we are uh, based in Plasto. And uh, we're a very diverse congregation. We've got three different congregations, all speaking three different languages. And it's also situated in a, in a diverse area of East London with many more, you know, different faiths and uh, people coming from different countries. Uh, and we started a food bank uh, during COVID, which uh, was mainly 
came about because it identified a need in the local community. And I think it's important to note that that's not in itself a bad thing. So we're not trying to say that transactional spaces are awful. We're just trying to offer a kind of alternative. And so because it came out of a focus on the program offered, the need offered, um, it wasn't focused on the people that was actually using it, both within the church and outside of the church. And after COVID, this environment and this atmosphere at St. Martin's Food Bank uh, continued and was maintained. And while there were pockets of relation, relationality going on, you know, people, you know, regulars would kind of catch up with one another and the volunteers, there wasn't a culture of building relationships at St. Martin's Food Bank. And so through a process of listening to people in the congregation, other institutions in the local area, people that were using the food bank, we are now in a process of disorganizing to reorganize the food bank. So we're now going to convert the food bank into a food pantry and a warm space. And we felt as a church that this aligned with our values better um, because it will allow for a more relational space to be created. And I think it's important to think that this, 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 this uh, action came about through, um, through relationality. You know, it came about through us speaking, through us listening to people. And then also the decision was made relationally. It was a whole church meeting where everyone was invited to uh, and people came, we, we spoke, we shared stories and then the decision was taken to, to move towards this model. So it, it's trying to show how you can start transactional. Uh, you know, some of us might, you know, how, how, how George told the story of, of St. Barnabas, you know, it's very, it started relationally from the get-go, but with us, we maybe started more transactional, but now on that path to being more relational. Um, I will finish there because I feel unconscious of time. Uh, and I'll pass over to Anna, who will talk about how we actually, what is the tool that we use to be more relational, which is the one-to-one. -one. So I'll pass to Anna now. Hi, everybody. Really good to be here. I can see some faces, which is really exciting. And um, so I'm Anna. I'm also a community organiser. So you probably heard that quite a few times. And I also work for CTC. Um, and I'm also a, re well, I'm a researcher as well. So I, um, I grew up in Brazil. So my dad uh, grew up in Brazil during the dictatorship. And, and he was a, a leader of, the, um, of a student union. And I grew up with him telling me all these amazing stories about when we come together, we build movements, we make change. So I'm very passionate about um, the, this idea of creating a relational culture that can move us from connecting to listen to building change. So hopefully this is the, this is the idea of this training. So we, we're talking about connection. We're going to be talking about um, um, listening. And then later on, hopefully, we're going to be talking about change. But um, the tool I want to be teaching you today is what is this tool that we, we talk about? And it is the one-to-one -one conversation. I know it sounds very small, like, oh, yeah, how can we transform? How can we make big changes with a one-to-one -one conversation? And uh, indeed we can. If you bear with us, by the time you, you come, comes March, the last training, you will see all the great things we can do together. But before I go into how we do the one-to-one -one and what is a one-to-one, -one, I wanted to explore with you why a one-to-one -one conversation really matters. So I'm going to ask a few questions. And, uh, and if you had the experience I mentioned in those questions, I wanted to, if you can, on the chat, write the feeling that you had through that experience. Does that make sense? Just some not not great. So just the feeling that you had. So the first question is, have you ever had someone make assumptions about you without knowing you first? Yeah, just write those feelings in the chat. Oh, second question. I'll go slow. Have you been part of a project or an initiative where people didn't address needs properly? And how did that make you feel when you saw that happen? And the third question is, have you ever been given a role or a responsibility or a task in the church or at work or just in life in general uh, without being consulted first? And it ended up being something that you probably didn't like. 
So I'm just going to have a quick look at my chat just to see the feeling. Yes, I can see frustration, insignificant, undermined, angry. Absolutely. Like I just if you want to keep going with the feelings, just add. But that's the thing, right? So when we are not heard, we don't feel seen. We feel like we don't matter. We feel like insignificant. Absolutely. We feel misunderstood. So same exercise, different questions. So keep writing on the chat as well. So have you ever, um, uh, oh, sorry, I lost, I lost something here. Yeah. Have you, have you ever had someone be curious about you in a good way? And how did that feel? Second question. Have you ever felt seen or heard by someone? And again, how does that feel? And the final question. Have you ever wondered the people that you see frequently at church, at warm space, at the road, your neighbors, at school pickup? Um, have you ever wondered who they were and you wish you knew more about them and that they knew more about you? Let's have a look. Oh, lots of great things on. Um, so. Oh, so I'm just. I'm just yeah, valued, empowered, honored, encouraged, uh, safe, loved. Uh, yeah, oh, absolutely. So the reason why uh, we want to talk to you about one-to-ones today and teach you about one-to-ones today is not because we, we don't think, I think we think you are doing it, but we want to offer you a process for you to think through how you can do that in a way that makes sense to you and what could be improved and what is working well and what can, can be better. Um, so I'm gonna share with you the next slide, which talks about um, a one-to-one, -one, um, what a one-to-one -one is and how we do them. So a one-to-one -one is a relational meeting where both sides share public passions and interests and challenges to build a relationship of trust. A lot of us talked about today um, that we want the the, um, the the warm space to be a place for connection, to be a place for... So we say, great, this is it. And I'm sure you're doing that anyway. But when we talk about one-to-one -one conversation is what we're saying. We say it's, a, it's, it's an opportunity for you to build a relationship of trust. A one-to-one -one is also um, uh, not... is a, is a um, conversation. It's not therapy and it's not an interview. So it's not a place where you only ask questions and the person is also only talking, but it's a place that there's some real exchange where you share a bit of yourself, they share about themselves. Um, we say about 45 minutes. So in terms of our work as organizers, but it, it really depends, you know, it, it depends on, on the context in your working. Sometimes it could be two 15 minutes, could be, uh, but, but the, the, the main thing is, is to actually just give attention to that one person that is in front of you. You are there for them because you want to build a relationship with them. Um, so a one-to-one -one, um, has a purpose. So you there is a reason why you're building with somebody. It's not just about building a relationship for the sake of building a relationship. So if you want to get to know the people that come to your warm space better or your volunteers better or the people from your church better, there is a context in which that relationship has been, has been created, has been done. Um, a one-to-one... -one, um, uh, is an opportunity for you to understand uh, people's experiences and learn from them. And it's a mirroring experience, experience, but also a public one. What does that mean? The more that you share, the more that you give, the more the other person is going to share and the more the other person is going to give. However, it's a public experience. So you only share and give what you feel comfortable and safe to do. You don't need to share lots of things, but as long as you're able to share your public passions, those things that you're happy for anybody to know. Um, a one-to-one -one is a meeting that leaves you both wanting more. So it's it's exciting. You feel 
oh my God, I want to know more about this person. I want to come back to this person. So that's why we say it, it can't drag. If you think it's drag, you end the one-to-one -one and come back another time. Um, it's an opportunity for you to respect, to be curious about that person, ask questions, but at the same time, try not to pry. We don't want to pry into people's lives if they don't want to share. Um, the most important thing is that a one-to-one -one is intentional. It's not, oh, I have a chat with somebody because I saw them. There is some intentionality. You want intentionally to get to know that person better. And you want that person to get to know you better. And so in the ideal world, you put in a diary. But I know sometimes if people come into the warm space, it's not necessarily the way it works. But hopefully if you see somebody, you can say, oh, next week when you come, uh, maybe we can sit down and have a chat. Uh, but so the person understand that you want to be that for them you want to listen to them and the final thing is a one-to-one -one is a habit so the more you do the more you get better at this it's an art form something that evolves uh, and improves with time the more you do it the more you get it easier and the more you feel comfortable and and then just become almost like second nature to you right so i think i'm good with time <laughs> second powerpoint I want to talk about uh, a one, the one-to-one -one questions. So now we have a sense of one-to-one -one me is, is this intentional conversation where you're building this relationship with somebody. And, uh, but we have this tendency of just staying on, on the assumptions, like what we think it's okay to know about people. Uh, so the type of questions that we used to ask, I think, on a, on a normal conversation is, what do you do? Um, how, where do you live? And, uh, and things like that. But what we're trying to, what we need to do in a one-to-one, -one, we have to be a little bit more courageous and ask those why questions. So why are you a community organizer? Um, why did you start the warm space? Uh, why after so many years, you're still here? Um, or what led you to create this and, and why? So these are the questions that allow you to have a sense, a depthness to the person, to the essence, but also it creates roots in the relationship. So it's the, the idea that you're trying to go deeper, trying to know them deeper. It's still in a, in a way that feels correct, right? But is having a sense of who the person really is, what they really, really care about. Um, so now I think we're going to have, we can actually, we can have 10 minutes. <laughs> now we can have 10 minutes, uh, for one-to-one. -one. So now you will then pilot this one-to-one. -one. It's only 10 minutes we're going to give you now to, with somebody else. Uh, we, uh, we'll say, uh, share it with you a question. So it's a framed one-to-one -one around this question that you can see on the, uh, on the PowerPoint but you have a chance now to be courageous and try to do that and pilot this one-to-one -one and see how it feels to see the person in that way, but also to see yourself in that way. So Ria, I think we, um, yeah, ready for one-to-ones. And when we come back, we'll feed back as a group. Emma, I can see your hand is up. Thank you. Yes, I, I found it a good exercise. I was shocked how, how um, transactional I am in my life. Um, and uh, and and that uh, and um and I learned from my person I learned something about um uh, uh about an issue you know an issue that I might need to know um so that was really uh, and it was really interesting just to see to find out if someone else is doing the same thing as me and it, and theirs is completely different and how they're doing and and I felt um and it was nice I just didn't feel alone I sort of felt like there are other people like me out there you know and um get with it with their the challenges doing the same thing so maybe feel included part of a big group thank you absolutely and this is a safe space i think if you want to have one-to-one -one with each other within this space where we're all learning from each other it's such a great um, place to start your your one-to-ones um journey um caroline i can see your hand is also up It actually, it was me that put it up. I'm Hannah. So I apologize to everyone seeing two faces when they're expecting one, but we work very closely together at our local community center down in Plymouth. Um, so we wanted to participate in this together so we could meet all of you. Um, and 
what I liked about the one-to-one was finding out how somebody in Edinburgh, so mm-hmm. the other side of like like miles and miles away, how they cope with their warm space, how they advertise their warm space, but also how you deliver that through the summer. Because it is a, a, a case of like, you want to bring the community together, but when it's not cold, you don't want to say bye-bye, see you later, see you next winter. You want to keep that community growing. So it was really good to find out how other people work and how other build, people build on their own communities. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing, Hannah. And no problem at all coming as a two, even better. Mm-hmm. Um, just if, like final word for me is that um, we find that one-to-one, especially when it's done with intention, is a very powerful tool. And the idea that you will see, um, it can move you from from a transactional to relational culture, but then it can also move you to a place where there is some collective leadership and even relational power and systemic change. And hopefully we're gonna share these more with you as you come to these trainings, but it's, it doesn't stop here. There is so much more depth that can, we can get from a one-to-one, from, from building this relational culture um, in your warm spaces. Um, back to you, Majana. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, I hope you all feel inspired. Um, We just wanted to reiterate the importance of building relationships. So think about opportunities that you have to connect with people. When are the moments when you can share the conversation with someone? It's important to book it in advance or create it creating spaces where one of your sessions that you are uh, organizing will be about building the relationship. So you could introduce what a one-to-one is. You could give examples of the questions that you can share and then encourage people to do it. So make it part of your regular schedule. It really works for us when it's ingrained in the culture of the organizations that we are working at. Um, Do a speed dating. We did one-to-one speed dating and it really worked. Uh, It's a good beginning to start this conversation. It takes time, but practice makes perfect. So we really encourage you to take part uh, in this exercise and take it with you. Uh, So we are aware that there was a lot from us today, but we wanted to give you some practical tools and we wanted to share some stories. So I strongly encourage you to join us next week for the drop-in session. Uh, So we will be with you on the 24th of January between 12 and 1. I know that some of you already registered. Please join us because this is where we want to give you a brief summary of the teaching training that we did and then hear from you. We really want to open this space for you, hear from you about the reactions to what we delivered for you today, but also think how do we implement one-to-ones, how do we implement relational culture in your spaces. Our next training is going to be in February, 23rd of February. So please register for that as well. And this is where we're going to move you from doing one-to-one conversations into listening, intentionally listening in the warm spaces, listening that then leads to developing action. Thank you very much from all of us. Uh, Thank you to Good Faith Partnership for helping us put the training together and for all the inspiration that you give to warm spaces across the country. It's wonderful to see that we are part of something bigger. Uh, Thank you to organizers who helped to put this training together and thank you to you for all the work that you are doing. So thank you very much and I hope to see you at our drop-in next week.